Thank you, Madam Speaker. So we get ourselves sort of organized. Um, last Monday, I did an entire hour here on the floor, you know, 55 minutes, and we actually did a presentation up and down the budget. Not this budget cycle, but basically, what does our country look like over the next 30 years? What's driving the projections of $112 trillion of debt 29 years from now? And look, it's one of those presentations that's a, rather uncomfortable for most of us because the punchline is demographics. And that's not what we typically do here. But the reality, we have a real issue. We're getting old very fast as a society. And if you actually look at the math, and we're, let's do a bit of a reminder here. So we're going to walk through a couple of these that are the same as last week. But the difference tonight is we're going to try to talk about a handful of solutions. And there's a big package of solutions. And most of them are really hard and are really going to be cantankerous around here. But there are solutions to deal with. So let's actually first walk through where we're at today. And once again, we won't worry about 1965 and the mix, but this is important that anyone watching this, fellow members of Congress, understand. Today, 2021, 77% of all the spending that will come from Washington is mandatory. Only 10% is defense. 13% is functionally what we vote on. And I think there's this huge misunderstanding around in the public that we march off to Congress and we're voting on these $4 trillion budgets. We're not. We're functionally voting on this little green wedge here that is discretionary spending. So if I came to you right now and said, okay, what's driving the debt over the next 30 years? I'm going to show you a number of slides that are going to show the budget's in balance except for two things, Social Security and Medicare, and it's mostly Medicare. Social Security is actually quite fixable. There's a number of levers. None of the levers will make anyone particularly excited or happy, but you, we once calculated we had like 24, 26 different levers that you can, to make Social Security solvent and keep our promises. Remember, Social Security and Medicare are earned benefits. It's a societal contract. We have an obligation to be there. But Medicare is a really tough one. And we need to actually, back to having the honest conversation, that what drives much of this debt? Well, if you see here, this is taxes paid in, benefits out for Social Security. And you'll notice they're pretty much in balance. You, Social Security is a fairly square deal. You, you get a little bit of a spiff on average for the average American. Where the numbers get really difficult is the average American couple is going to put in about $161,000 into the Part A Medicare, which is only the trust fund for just the hospital portion. The pharmaceuticals, the, 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 the other doctor visits, the other things are general fund. So when you're paying your FICA tax, you're paying this here. But that average couple is going to get 522000 in benefits. So the differential from 161 to 522 is the driver of the vast majority of U.S. sovereign debt over the next 30 years. It's this differential here. It's not that complicated. And one of the great frustrations here is my brothers and sisters on the left will come behind the microphone and say things like, well, if we had Medicare for all, or we expanded the ACA, Obamacare. That's not true. And, and, and if anyone just takes a quick breath and steps back, and, and look, Republicans are guilty on part of this too. Those are financing bills. The ACA was financing. It's who got subsidized and who has to pay. Medicare for all is just a change of who pays. None of that is about what we pay. And the Republican alternative was the same. It was about who got subsidized and who had to pay. So what we're going to talk about is some of the revolutions we can have in what we pay, changing the cost of health care. But we first need to understand 
the scale, the scale of these. And look, this is functioning the same size as we just had, but it's important to understand that every dollar, you know, for every dollar in, particularly on Medicare, we get $3 in benefits back. And now you start to do that with the demographics of the country. And, and this is just a graphic. So you see the orange here. That's us just getting old. That's just simply us moving into our benefit years. The green is health care costs. We've known people were going to turn 65 for how many years in this country? And we're still avoiding the issue. But you start to see, when you start to get into the 2050s, this here, your country has 112 trillion of publicly borrowed debt. And 78% of that is just Medicare. So this is one of the slides that I actually see in my dreams because it's really that, if you, if you understand math, if you're willing to own a calculator, this slide should scare you to death. So the purple is functionally, you know, the, the borrowing of Social Security, then the interest on it. This is the, bar, the spending of Medicare and the interest on that. And you'll notice in this board here, $112 trillion of borrowing, and it's mostly the cost of Medicare and the financing of that. The rest of the budget, if you remove Social Security and Medicare, is actually in balance. And, and I come, just as a quick aside before the next board, how many times today behind these microphones did anyone come up and say, this is the functionally the greatest threat to the stability of the country, is the fact that we've waited so long, we're well into the baby boom moving into retirement, and you can start to see the debt curve just explode on us. So if you take a look at this board. Now, remove, if you remove the pandemic years here and just functionally look at this 10-year cycle, why this is important. And I know there's a lot of numbers, a lot of colors here. This board is basically saying one very simple thing. The vast majority, matter of fact, almost the entire debt for this decade and the decade after that, and the decade after that, but for this decade, is driven solely by Social Security and Medicare. So think of that. In functionally nine budget years, your country is scheduled to have functionally about $2.2 trillion of borrowing, just borrowing every year. And almost all of that just came from Social Security and Medicare. And look, this is basically, dear Lord, please don't let interest rates move against us. But you start to actually see the Medicare outlays, you know, the Medic you know, Medicare revenues, and, and then you get these arguments saying, well, if you would adjust defense. Well, the, the defense is the line down here. And you start to realize, when, excuse me, the, the Medicare taxes and those are down here you start to look at these gaps. This, this is where we're at. Um, and so, sorry, I was skipping my uh, head at board. So if you were to eliminate the entire defense budget, so let's just wipe out the defense budget, you realize it buys you a year or two, but that's about it, because this is the defense projected defense line, and this is Social Security and Medicare where we're going. So you would think, members of Congress, if you actually cared about keeping our promises that we're going to protect Social Security, we're going to protect Medicare, how come every member of Congress isn't walking behind this microphone holding up these boards and saying, we're going to work on a solution to this? Instead, this discussion is almost toxic around here. I can't tell you how many members I run into who say, David, I want to talk about the debt and deficits too, and the fact that as we grab all the capital stock of the country and maybe the world, that we're going to slow down the economy. We're going to be poor. Poor people will be poor. Rich people will be poor. The country's 
productivity will be crushed. Oh, but I can't actually talk about the drivers of the debt. And I'm going to actually say there are solutions. There's a way to actually start to take a step back and say, if we're willing to have an honest moment and say, okay, Medicare, because the vast majority of Medicare is a general fund expenditure, what do we do? It's complicated. There's lots of parts of it. But let's first understand, there, there's a rule about health care. And this is not only Medicare, Medicaid, and VA, and Indian Health Services, but everything. 5% of the population is over 50% of the spending. So if you love and care about people, but you also care about spending and health care costs, we need to understand the 5% of our brothers and sisters who drive most of our spending, but also are the folks often living in absolute misery. Turns out, if you're willing to spend and invest to end people's misery, ends up being a way you can actually also take on that debt and deficit. And look, Republicans often come behind these microphones and we have all sorts of ideas. My suggestion is we do all of them, but we need to be realistic. Um, just, just as some of my Democrat colleagues will walk behind a microphone and say, well, if we had Medicare for all, back to the comment before, it's a financing bill. It doesn't actually change the cost of procedures. Unless they're willing to ratchet down and go into rationing, which they swear they won't, it's just an alternative way of paying for it. And then we have Republicans who will come here and say, well, price transparency. I love price transparency. But the best peer-reviewed academic studies out there, it's only 0.1 to 0.7% of improvement on price for health care costs. Now, you still should do it, but if you really want to start thinking about things that drive health care costs, what would happen if I came to you and said, you saw on that previous board, what, it was about $78 trillion dollars of borrowing, just borrowing, is Medicare over the next 29, 30 years. 31% of Medicare is just diabetes. 31% of diabetes, uh, of Medicare costs is diabetes. And that's just Medicare. We, we haven't done the math um, for Medicaid, for Indian Health Services, for VA, for just the general populations. But it helps you start to think about Okay, we know chronic conditions, 5% is over 50% of spending. We know in Medicare, 31% is just diabetes. Maybe we're starting to understand the drivers of what actually consumes our health care costs. So my, my proposal to anyone that's willing to hear is let's actually do something fairly radical. The concept of stepping up and legalizing technology in healthcare, but also investing in disruption. So, right now, the, the left actually has some proposals that would functionally um, do some really quirky things of as soon as a drug comes off exclusivity, you'll, we're gonna, they're going to start to tax it, and hopefully, that taxing actually starts now to move to, to create generics are forced the one over here to become less expensive as now because it's off functionally exclusivity off patent. And, and I'd like a radically different thinking. How about investing in absolutely curative, disruptive research and drugs, but also technology? So let's actually walk through something that just I find fascinating, and this board's a little hard because there's a lot of noise on it, but 16% of U.S. healthcare expenses, so 16% of U.S. healthcare expenses is people not taking their drugs appropriately. Huh? Think of that. That's a half a tr that's like $550 billion a year. So over a half trillion dollars a year is when someone doesn't take their hypertension medicine, and then they have a stroke. Turns out the fastest thing you could do tomorrow is the technology that actually helps people 
know that they should have taken their hypertension pill or their insulin on a certain time. The technology, because this is 16% of all healthcare. So if tomorrow you could remind grandma to take her medicines on the proper times of the day, someone with hypertension, that they took their pills so they don't have a stroke. 16% of healthcare. And we have real simple technologies out there. We have the pill bottle cap that talks at you, that reminds you, saying, hey, you know, you didn't open me today. Um, for someone that may have multiple pills at certain times of the day, you actually now have, and there's apparently all sorts of versions of this now, that drop the pill in the bottle and send you a text message, send your grandkids a text message to, you know, also to know that the pills are there. The technology is here. And almost no one ever thinks about personal technology like this as a way to crash the price of healthcare. But it's 16%, it's $550 billion in a single year. Not 10 years, in a single year. So over a half a trillion dollars a year, you could strip out of healthcare costs if you could just get our brothers and sisters to take their pharmaceuticals in a way that keeps them healthy. Now for some more radical proposals. So far this year, there's two papers out. Um, one US based, actually one Taiwanese base, um, but both from very prestigious universities. They appear to be peer reviewed. Um, we've been reading through them multiple times. We're trying to get other comments that talk about, hey, there may be a cure for type one diabetes. There may be a cure, still has a long ways to go, but there actually appears to be some in-lab breakthroughs on type 2 diabetes. Wouldn't you and I, the left, the right, stop some of the monkey business around here and say, if we know 31% of Medicare cost, and we know Medicare is the primary driver of U.S. sovereign debt, it's time for an Operation Warp Speed for diabetes. You don't have to call it Operation Warp Speed because I know that triggers some folks on the left. But the fact of the matter is a concentration of bringing disruption to cure people to end misery. Because we've got to stop this think thought process here of saying, well, the way we're going to end people's misery is we're going to just build more clinics so you have more access to a doctor. My argument is have the revolution because the revolution is here. Just think a couple of years ago we were dealing with the cost of liver transplants for hepatitis C. And then we came up with a cure. We can do this. And now you start to understand there's clinical trials out there for some new types of stem cell therapy. And I read this paper multiple times because it was complicated and fascinating. Um, uh, stem cell therapy, they worked through the rejection problem. And it appears, at least the early paper, be a cure for type 1. And there's a derivative paper that's out there, um, actually from Taiwanese University, that is talking about their success in type 2. It's a different thought process. How often do you say one of the greatest things we can do for U.S. sovereign debt and not collapsing this society and destroying my six-year-old daughter's economic future as well as anyone that's heading towards retirement is actually how we invest our money today in things that end people's misery and by ending that misery all of society as well as those individuals benefit. The other thing and the amusing part is I've been on this floor for several years talking about messenger RNA. Back when we used to call it CAR-T and those, you, you heard the stories about you know, taking someone um, uh, functionally, uh, their immune system, the cancer they had, you know, doing functionally what we now know as mRNA. Well, it looks like the breakthroughs and the fact that we now have turned much of what is diseases into software problems. And, and this is hard for a lot of folks to think through, particularly in the time where we have those who you know, are very vi um, virus and vaccine conscious. 
but there's incredible hope here. So as you all know, right now, going into the field is a functioning a vaccine for malaria. Now, it's only about 30% is the data effective, but when teamed up with some other um, pharmaceutical, it's like 70%. It will change misery around the world. Well, it turns out that same messenger RNA goes far beyond COVID. We're actually now starting to understand malaria, a whole bunch of cancers. Do you know um, one of the published papers from early this summer looks like they think they actually have a cure for HIV, um, influenza, heart disease. It's fascinating, but helping the body actually, its immune system work and rehab heart. There's some amazing, amazing things. We, as you saw the papers earlier this year about cystic fibrosis and thinking we're almost there for a cure. Remember, 5% is 50% of our healthcare spending. Maybe it's time to rethink about the world and the fact that we're going to invest in the disruption that is cures that end the misery instead of financing a country where we might actually lower drug costs, but the disruptions, the cures that could come in the future don't show up. And we can show you in lots of studies, there's multiples out there, because when we're looking at the Democrats' HR3, that by the end of the decade, you saw the curve actually go up in healthcare costs because the cures didn't show up. The other thing, and th this is not a particularly great slide, um, and it's getting a little old, but we have a whole binder in the office of articles talking about algorithms and in this case AI being able now to detect cancers very very early and the fact by doing that with this type of technology and technology that you can have at home you can actually almost have wearable you can have in your own medicine cabinet that using those types of technologies is also part of our path to crash the price of health care because remember, we're not going to change the United States getting older fast, the graying of America. But where we can bend the curve, bend misery, and also bend the threat of the incredible amount of debt we're building up every single day, it's saying we're all in. We're going to do wearables. We're going to legalize technology. We're going to actually invest. And the fact of the matter is, we, it's happening right now where we're actually seeing countries around the world realizing how big of a problem diabetes is. And now there's awards going out saying, wow, we actually now have lines of research that look like we can finally disrupt the disease. So this is sort of the follow-up on last week where we did the whole slide chart of what's actually happening in U.S. sovereign debt and how much trouble we're really in and how fast it's building. You have to do a whole series of things. You have to grow the economy consistently. You have to manage tax policy. You have to manage regulatory policy in a way that's for maximizing economic expansion. You actually have to deal with immigration in a way that maximizes economic growth opening up your border, importing massive amounts of, let's be brutal about this, poverty, where that poverty and inflation are crushing the working poor in this country. The working poor will be substantially poorer at the end of this decade because of these policies. That's cruel. How about if we had a growth oriented? Because growth is moral. So you do these things of tax policy, regulatory policy, immigration policy, and then the financing and, 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 and tax incentives and the encouragement to do things that disrupt. Because you could actually do it in both healthcare, you could do it in energy, you can do it in so many transportation, where we can make the future actually pretty darn amazing and actually end a lot of suffering. And turns out it's the path that actually bends that debt curve that wipes us out as a society if we don't actually start to tell the truth and deal with it. 
There is a path. There is optimism. Every day this place squanders working on the real problems and then said of the insanity of some of the policies that are being proposed today that the economists on both sides say we'll make the country poorer by the end of the decade. We're going the wrong direction. And with that, Madam Speaker, I'm going to yield back, hoping at least someone out there hears the message that there is a path. It's just getting harder and harder to get there because every day we fall further in debt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, we're going to do a couple of things tonight. Um, most of it's going to be economic heavy. We're going to actually go over the Democrats' social spending bill, its economic effects. But first I wanted to touch on something that actually uh, I'm somewhat hopeful that the left and the right could embrace, you know, thinking of what we've gone through for almost two years now, and that's the pandemic. So if I came to you tomorrow and said, um, okay, we have vaccinations, but we're about to have therapeutics. Um, think about this. You've all seen the news that we now have a second um, drug company, actually, um, Wall Street Journal today, has an amazing, wonderful article on the protease inhibitors and their effectiveness and the fact that Pfizer has publicly said their antiviral medication is up around I think it was 89% effective. Now, it's a lot of pills. It may need to be taken with a second pharmaceutical. But isn't this the holy grail? So we've talked about this over and over, saying you now have home COVID tests. And now you can take your antiviral at home. And you start to understand the elegance of how this type of antiviral works in sort of snipping the proteins and making them so they don't grow or they can't attach to the cell walls. So if this exists technology-wise, and one of the antivirals is already in front of the FDA today, the other one, I think we saw um, a news blip this afternoon that the second one maybe on Tuesday will be presented, the Pfizer pharmaceutical will be presented to the FDA, it may take a month or so. If we're in a world now where we have multiple vaccines, we actually now have therapeutics and antiviral home testing kits. You can take the antiviral at home. It's time, once these are approved, to declare the pandemic over. And why is this really important? Think of the societal friction, the battles we've created by mask mandates, by vaccine mandates, we see now the data of how much in our labor supply, folks are saying, no, I, I, I believe in body autonomy. I'm not taking the vaccine or not doing this or doing that. If the reality of it is we've been so successful as a country, as a society, and believing in science, remember how many times did we hear that? Believing in science, if the FDA approves, which we're hopeful maybe happens in the next month, the antivirals and um, the press releases from the pharmaceutical companies is there will be a couple hundred thousand um, sets by the end of this year and apparently millions available starting in the new year. It's time to declare the pandemic over. And our office has put together a piece of legislation. We're going to put it in circulation once we've sort of vetted it um, in the next couple days. Um, I would encourage any of my brothers and sisters on the left and the right that if you believe in science um, and you really want a solution, it's time to embrace the fact of how far we've come and the solution is here. So with that, we're going to actually do a little bit of basic economics and try to tap some of the discussion that I think has been missed on the left social spending bill. Um, first, let's have an honest conversation where we are economically right now and what our world looks like. And if any of you are planning on having a retirement, if any of you have children or grandchildren and you actually give a darn about them, first understand 
how much trouble we're in immediately, right now, today. The CBO numbers, in 29 years, we are at $112 trillion of borrowed money. Public and borrowed, and that's inflation adjusted. $112 trillion public and borrowed. This isn't borrowing from, you know, where they, we take credit for borrowing from trust funds. This is publicly borrowed, inflation adjusted, and functionally, in 29 budget years, we're at $112 trillion, and that's the CBO estimate. If you're a young person and you want to be honest with them, saying your economic future is about to be brutalized, and the reality of it is, and I've done this on the floor multiple times, and it's, it's fascinating how many on the left and even the right, when you start to walk through what drives U.S. sovereign debt, it's a very uncomfortable conversation. Because the fact of the matter is, Medicare is the primary driver of U.S. sovereign debt, Social Security, second, and the rest of the budget is in balance. At the end of the 30-year model right now, according to CBO, the rest of the budget, if you strip Medicare, if you strip Social Security out, the budget actually has a positive balance. If you believe it is a moral obligation for us to keep our promises, that Medicare will be there that Social Security will be there. Why isn't this what we work on every day instead of discussions about how we can spend a whole bunch more money, take over a whole bunch more of the economy, slow the economy down, and make this nation poorer? And that's what we're going to show is the economic models that show the Democrats' spending bill actually crushes poor people. It actually makes the working poor poorer. It makes society poor, and, and I don't believe that's the intention, but it is the economics. And sometimes when you get your, your math wrong, it's a, it's a, it's a level of cruelty. The, I mean, a, a simple thought experiment. What are the two things you do to crush the working poor? Inflation? Well, we're doing a great job on that, aren't we? The fact of the matter is what inflation does to the working poor is absolute economic cruelty. The second thing, you open your borders up, adding millions of individuals with similar skill sets. So you're that individual that didn't finish high school, but you're out there hanging drywall, you're, you have a family, you're getting good at your profession, you're trying to, to learn and how to move up, and then you flood the market with people with similar skill sets, and there's great peer-reviewed papers out there that talk about just what we've done at the border. A decade from now, you've made the working poor poor, and now overlay what all this spending has done inflation-wise. If we as members of Congress give a darn about the working poor, the economic violence that's being committed right now by the policies coming out of this Congress, it's time to step up and deal with the reality. The problem is the working poor aren't our contributors. They're not the ones showing up here lobbying us but they are the individuals we have a moral obligation to do good things for, and that's not what's happening. So we're gonna walk through some of where we are today. You gotta understand that the national jet debt right now is projected to leap to 200% in 2050, so functionally 29 budget cycles from now. And if the Biden proposals, now these are the ones that were proposed during the election. I gotta accept a bunch of that has gotten trimmed back in the debate. Not as much as you might think, we're gonna go over that. You go functionally from 200% of debt to GDP, meaning the borrowed money will be 200 times bigger than GDP. We're heading towards, if you add it all up, in 29 budget years, you're over 328% a debt to GDP. If any of you are thinking about having a retirement, if you're thinking about your kids, your grandkids, this is what wipes us out as a society. But it's terrifying to talk about because it's hard. It requires lots of levers. You have to get immigration right. You have to get 
um, finance right. You have to get spending right. You've got to get tax policy right. You have to do everything that maximizes economic expansion. And then the holy grail, you're going to have to crash the price of health care. Not shift around who pays for it. Which, remember, the ACA, many know as Obamacare, the Republican alternative, Medicare for all, in many ways is about who pays and who gets subs subsidized. It's not about what we pay. And cannot tell you how many times I've come to this floor and tried to drill that into the way we think. But instead, the scam here is we talk about, well, you're going to get subsidized, but we did nothing to what we pay. The difference is we just borrow money, that's the federal government, and pay for it that way. Even a 100% tax rate on small businesses, upper class families, so 100% tax rate, so you're taking every single dollar, you can't even come close to balancing the budget and balancing it long term. The numbers are this ugly. When you take a look, it's, it's not that hard. The 2050 number, the, you know, if you take every dime, even of folks who make a million or 500,000, you take every dime, you don't get close. The numbers are this ugly. The share of federal tax revenue spent on interest in the national debt is projected to surge but here's the number that terrifies me. If we move up two points, two points functionally at the 2050-2051 mark, 100% of revenues, 100% of revenues in that 30-year budget window, move up two points from where we are right now, our baseline, 100% of tax revenues will be just covering the interest cost. So anyone familiar with a book, it was called The Black Swan, okay, and that Taleb also wrote another book, and I understand there's other econom economists out there, Gilder and others, who disagree with parts of the model, but there was one concept of making yourself fragile. It, the, the, the simple example of you go to the airport 10 times, you know if you leave at exactly this moment, you can get to the airport as, exactly as your flight is getting ready to board, and the first time there's a car accident, you miss your flight. We're doing that type of thing to our entire country, to my six-year-old daughter, to anyone else out there. We're living on a razor's edge. And you saw that last slide, two points moving back to which would be closer to normality, interest rate-wise. In the 30-year budget window, 100% of revenues, receipts, if you want to use the technical term, will go just to cover the interest. Do you understand how fragile we've made the economics of this country? And then the debate here is how to spend more money. I, I understand money gets you reelected, promising things gets you reelected, gets nice contributions, and it's absolutely perverse when you think about where we're at. So now let's talk about the budget gimmicks. So this is Many of you are going to refer to it as the Build Back Better plan. In our office, we're calling it the social spending plan because that's what it is. It is laced with gimmicks. It's going to be fascinating come Friday to see how CBO ultimately scores these. A um, little disappointed on what we've seen from joint tax and some of the others. I don't think we're getting actual quality dynamic scoring. But that's hard. It takes time. You've got to lay it out and break it apart and try to understand what the economic effects are. But you walk through the gimmicks. And, and a, good, a simple example is the White House has estimated $400 billion in uh, some of the joint tax scores from IRS collecting more money. But CBO came out and said, no, it's not $400 billion, it's $120 and you start to realize the debates you're hearing on the floor here are completely stacked with absolutely fraudulent numbers. Um, I remember how hard when we did tax reform, we had to work to justify dynamic scoring and make the math as honest as possible and work. 
And it was our brothers and sisters on the left that absolutely were insistent. Today, they would never hold themselves to the same standard that they demanded from us just a couple years ago. So let's walk through an example of one of the absolute frauds that the left is using. So President Trump had a drug rebate. And this is a little geeky, but, but it's important to understand that. And ultimately, the rebate was going to be to the consumer. So you're on Medicare, you're, you're in line at the pharmacy. The rebate that would have gone into the backside of the um, provider, the acquirer, the, the the, 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 think of it as the wholesaler of the pharmaceutical, that rebate now comes to you at the counter. It means you as the consumer would get the value, but it would mean the cost of pharmaceuticals would go up for government because the government isn't ultimately getting that value. So here's the sort of steps, the Trump administration's rebate rule. It was estimated to cost about $150 billion over 10 years. Speaker Pelosi said it will never happen. Democrat leadership here said it will never happen. Democrat leadership in the Senate said unacceptable, will never happen. This was never, ever, ever, ever going to happen. So how do you take something, and this is the whole system of how you know, the consumer would have gotten the benefit of those um, rebates, but it would have cost the federal government $150 billion over 10 years, but it was never going to happen. Unless, of course, you're a Democrat looking for money to spend on their social entitlement bill, all of a sudden saying, hey, this is never going to happen, but we can score it in, so we're going to use it. It's just another gimmick. It's a con. It's a fraud. If we were doing this, we would be ashamed of ourselves and should be. But this is actually the scam that now is Democrat leadership. So you take a look at the budget gimmicks that are already built into here. And you start to realize the left social spending bill is like a house of cards. Now they may get some scoring. Like the last one I was just showing you, CBO will give them that $150 billion. There'll be a nice little footnote saying this was never really going to become policy, but because it was a proposal and they're canceling the proposal, we're going to give them the 150 or maybe $145 billion of credit. But the public needs to understand those trillions and trillions and trillions, 112 trillion on the baseline as it is right now in 29 budget years, that's how you get there. When the left will say, this is paid for. No, it's not. And they know that, they're not dumb. They're manipulative, but they're not dumb. And you start to look at just the games being done and then the spending. And, and that's the other thing we're going to work through here is how much of this spending do they really plan to cancel in year two? So you're seeing some spending scoring saying we estimate this is one and three quarter trillion. Wink, wink, nod, nod. But when it becomes a 10-year, instead of disappearing in the second year, you're four and a half plus trillion dollars of new obligations. And you look up and down the different budget gimmicks. And one of the reasons I did this slide, because it's a little more economically difficult concept. So you actually have in there um, an adjusted gross income surcharge on the top income earners. You know where the Democrats' proposal is to do a very similar thing on corporations. Um, alternative minimum tax that's also being put on corporations, we're just now starting to model how much it actually will slow down the economy, and here's why. You have this thing we call expensing. It was one of the great economic drivers, particularly in 2018, 2019. Remember, we far exceeded revenue projections. You, income inequality truly shrank. Poverty shrank. Um, food insecurity shrank. It was, the poor got dramatically less poor. They were two amazing years. It's a great model to demonstrate what supply side economics really does. But a lot of the economic expansion was because of something called expensing. 
So you buy a piece of equipment, it makes your company more productive, you're able to pay people more. It moves technology, moves business production into the next century, it moves it forward. If you do a minimum alternative tax at a corporate level, you no longer get the economic value of that expensing. I, I know this is really geeky, but it's really important to understand we're just now starting to model saying, oh heavens, so the Democrats are doing the wink, wink, nod, nod, con of they're not taking away the expensing, which is the primary driver that we saw in productivity from the last few years since tax reform, but by doing this alternative minimum tax calculation, you don't get the value of that depreciation. All of a sudden, the investment in capital products, capital goods, capital equipment will disappear. It's another example of really bad understanding of most basic economics. The other thing, and, and you can understand why the left wants to do this, is the number of new IRS agents, the other, um, the number of agencies that will have hundreds, potentially hundreds of thousands of new employees. Remember, one of the models was 80,000 new IRS employees. Well, okay, maybe it makes sense if, if I was on the Democrat side or I represented um, you know, Northern Virginia or areas like that where I have you know, lots of unionized government working um, constituents, but, but we need to be honest about that that the Build Back Better, the social spending bill on the left, massively increases the bureaucracy. You start to look at the hundreds of millions that are being put in to expand the size of the national bureaucracy. It's not like we're doing the leap of technology, saying well, the investment is going to go to make society more productive. It's like our argument of air quality and, and environmental quality using technology is the way to make us healthier. Instead, the left designs it in ways where there's new armies of public employees. And I gotta congratulate the left. And you're gonna see some slides here. Um, we're gonna be number one. Yep, United States will be absolutely number one on the highest tax rates on income in the entire industrialized world. But, Starting to see, if you're a resident of California, you're going to be about 64.7% for top income earners. And you know, look, high income earners, fine. If you're in Arizona, you're going to be at 55.9. New York gets the prize. They're going to be over 66% for top income earners when you do the federal, the surcharges, and state and local taxes. Don't we have lots of data already in the economic literature of what happens when you start to hit these confiscatory levels of tax on income? What do people do? You start to realize saying, okay, I can work and get this tax rate, or I can take my resources, put them in other types of things, municipal bonds, other types of things, reap the rewards from that, because if the more than half of the upper income, income now goes to government. You've just created an incentive not to invest, not to take risks, but just take the money, put it in safe places, and don't play anymore. And the model, and, and, I'm, and I'm frustrated, because I know the tax foundation's been trying to model the taxes, but we don't have good data yet on what does this mean in future GDP growth. Back to the very first board we held up. Our society is heading towards a debt cliff. The baseline as it is today from CBO in 29 budget years, we're at $112 trillion of borrowed money in today's dollars. And that's what, that, I mean, that's what policy is today. When you start to do this and economic growth slows, you bring the functionally the financial apocalypse a lot sooner. So let's actually also talk through a couple other duplicities that are in the Democrats' Build Back Better social spending bill. They sure do like rich people. 
Two-thirds of the millionaires get a tax cut under the Build Back Better. And if you take the folks getting over a million dollars, 66% of them actually benefit and this is one of the things we've come to the floor now for almost a year talking about instead of raising taxes and the rhetorical, you know, that, that we hear over and over from the left, uh, we rich need to pay their fair share. Maybe we should just stop subsidizing them. We've come to the floor over and over and showed that there's almost $1.4 trillion of subsidies that go to the very top, top, top income earners. And if you stop the subsidy, you don't create the economic distortions. So this is the great scam. Democrats are saying, we're going to raise the taxes, these surcharges, but then we're going to turn around, and as long as these rich people do what we ask them to do, they buy the right type of solar panels, the right type of electric car, we're going to turn and hand them cash. Now, it's something that the vast majority of Americans will never be able to afford. But you'll be happy to know that the Democrats' plan is to subsidize the rich. And it gets, gets even darker. So now the Democrats are going to put in SALT, state and local tax deduction. And the great thing is, if you make a million dollars a year, looks like you're going to get the vast majority, you're going to get the highest amount of this money. But if for the population that's $400,000 and up, they get the majority of the salt. It's once again the Democrats subsidizing the rich and the really rich. And for everyone else who's functionally making $150,000 and less, you don't get anything. You don't get any value here. How can this be? I mean, it, it, am I living in a parallel universe where the rhetoric from the left is tax rich people, wink, wink, nod, nod. We're not only going to subsidize them when we buy the things we want them to buy, but then we're going to give them additional tax benefits. We're going to make additional things they spend money on deductible. And the rest of the population just be screwed. And I grabbed this one, substantially basically makes some other points. So think of this, in the Democrat social spending bill, best as I can identify, there's about $100 billion to finance amnesty. Okay, so it, it functionally gives a five-year visa to millions of folks who are here undocumented illegally. But you remember our earlier discussion? What are the two things you do to create economic violence to the working poor? Inflation, well, too many, remember our elementary school economics class? Too many dollars chasing too few goods. So the left spends, put out lots and lots and lots and lots of money to people's bank accounts, because that's great politics, instead of using those resources to say, we're going to make our society more efficient, more clean, more productive. And that productivity means you could pay people more and you have a society that grows that maybe we can take on our debt problem. But we did it just backwards. So now you get to see what Keynesian economics look like. And are you enjoying the inflation yet? Because it looks like it's going to continue to pop. And then flooding society with lots of other low skill workers. Okay. Well, I, it'll be interesting to see how long it is before the left actually has to come in here and say we need to do additional subsidies to the working poor because we stuck it to them. And, and look, if anyone has a question, we have multiple papers, university peer review papers, talking about how the Democrats plan actually will make the poor poorer by the end of the decade. University of Chicago, four PhD economists published a paper a couple of weeks ago showing that the lowest quartile of income, and I despise the term quartiles, but that's what economists use, will be poorer at the end of the decade. Now, a lot of that is because the Democrats' unwillingness to attach the benefits to 
learning job skills to actually working. They've severed those. You would have thought we learned that during the Clinton years when you rewarded work, rewarded going and gaining job skills. We're going back to the bad old days of saying, if you want to just not work, you'll be happy. As long as you vote for the right party, we're going to send you a check. Does anyone see the cruelty here? Now, there are some things in the spending that, look, um, in, endangered plants, okay, it's 4.9 million. Um, desert fish, okay, 4.9 million. Um, freshwater mussels, which are actually a real problem. But it's $19 million, and everyone understands the difference between a million dollars and billions. So $100 billion for amnesty, but $19 million for functionally, um, we'll call it invasive species and protecting others. You know, it, it's like the drop of a bucket in an ocean wave. Um, it, but it gives you a sense where the, so the Democrats get a nice talking point, but the math is absolutely perverse. Ultimately, over the next decade, you got to deal with this one way or the other. Either what the left is doing is when you're going to see the scoring this Friday of how many programs saying, well, we're going to spend all this money on a transfer payment, European-style transfer payment, but it's only for two years. Wink, wink, nod, nod. A future Congress won't continue it. You, you all remember the fraud of the last time we had a Speaker Pelosi a decade ago, and there were multiple spending bills where the way they fit into something called PAYGO is we're going to spend this, this much, this much, but on the fifth year, we're going to just pretend the program no longer spends any money. Well, this is now the more modern version of that fraud that was committed financially, budgetarily, is we're going to spend the money for year two, and then we're going to pretend it stops, and that way we hit certain budget boxes so to meet the reconciliation, and wink, wink, nod, nod, will the voters be paying attention to? But let's say they're honest. It's not likely, but let's say that, that honestly that's not the scam, that they fully intend to spend all this money, get themselves through the next election, and then stop the spending. Well, in that case, the taxes are permanent because the taxes don't expire, even though what we can tell best from the revenues, they don't come close to covering all the spending. And if the spending is made permanent, the social entitlement transfers over the 10 years, this is trillions and trillions of dollars out of balance. And I understand, and, and look, this is one of my great sins. And I think a lot of us on the conservative side, we sound like accountants on steroids. You know, we come and talk about GDP and workforce, labor force participation. But the fact of the matter is if you care for people, if you believe growth, growth, economic growth is moral, that it provides opportunities, that that's how you save for retirement, that's how you help your child go to college. That's how you have a better house, a better life. It's, it's, it's the opportunities that growth creates. So when you see someone like me come behind the microphone and talk about GDP and, 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 and the benefits it brings, it's a number. It, it's, it's classical economics. It's also that poor family that's trying to be less poor. And the Tax Foundation has done a bunch of modeling that makes it pretty darn clear that the left social spending bill is going to make our entire society poorer. I mean, you start to look at these numbers over the decade. And at the end of the decade, we won't have grown as much. We're going to be missing, I mean, in, 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 in a decade, we're missing a half a trillion dollars 
of, of economic growth, of GDP. Do you remember our very first board? What is, for my little girl, for everyone else out there, this is what wipes us out as a society. This is the thing that this body is terrified to talk about. And this is already the baseline. The baseline from CBO already says in 29 budget years, we're $112 trillion of borrowed money. And that's assuming really stable interest rates. It's assuming no more wars. It's assuming no more major recessions. We were doing one attempt to try to calculate these numbers. So the Penn Wharton model that was published actually today where they were trying to figure out how much more it would add to the debt. So the Penn Wharton model said if the spending is continued, which is the obvious thing is going to happen, it adds 24.4% to the debt. Okay. Now, we didn't have enough time to break through all their tables, and, and we'll work through that. But just off the top of your head, $112 trillion. If you added 24.4% on it, that's um, what uh, close to $140 trillion of borrowed money. 139 something. Um, you got to understand, this is what the left is leading us to. Instead of coming in and saying, we're going to protect Medicare by investing in things that cure. Remember, this Medicare dollar, you know, $77 trillion plus of borrowing in the next 29 years just to cover the Medicare portion shortfall, 31% of that is just diabetes. You could have a connection here between the left and the right saying, we're going to do an Operation Warp Speed and go at diabetes because it turns out by curing the misery, you also have a major effect on the debt. That's creativity. That's being rational instead of trying to buy your next election and pretending to finance it with a whole bunch of gimmicks that don't really create revenues, that are going to create borrowed money. And it's not CBO, it's not me, it's the outside groups that play it straight, tell Penn Wharton and others that they're lying. Because they've done, I, th I think they underscore economic growth on some things, but um, the fact of the matter is, if the left is about to pass a piece of legislation at the end of this week, that looks like it's likely to add another 24.4% to the debt. Does anyone see the level of immorality in wiping out economic growth and the opportunity? And we had a couple of years there where it was working. I mean, the fact of the matter is 2018, 2019 were Goldilocks. And it was done because we invested in the things that create opportunity and growth instead of the model right now where the left is going to invest in things that functionally slow economic growth down, make individuals dependent on the federal government, disincentivize participating in the economy. And if any of you have ever read any of your textbooks from what the world looked like in the 70s, where the last time the left did something very similar to this, the societal breakdowns, the inflation, the misery. Once again, we're about to see the financing of misery instead of investing in the things that actually would create opportunity and growth. Um, we're better than this. I know it would take someone on the Democrat side, they'd have to stand up to their base and explain basic economics. But there is a path that works. And if you give a darn about the poor, the working poor, the middle class, ultimately the data says at the end of the decade, if the left passes their Build Back Better social entitlement spending bill, they're going to be poor. 
and that's what we're about to do to the country, and this place should be ashamed. Madam Speaker, with that, I yield back. Madam Speaker, um, I actually have family members who can't pronounce it, so <laughs> welcome to the family. You're too kind. Thank you. It, it's Try putting Schweikert on a political sign. It just goes on and on. Um, but, and I appreciate the kindness. Um, Madam Speaker, um, tonight we're going to try to do and sort of an extension of, of the last couple times I've been behind this microphone and have a discussion about what is actually going on on the big fiscal picture of our country. Um, I'm gonna be a little mean to some of the Democrat policies, but I'm gonna show it factually of how I think it actually hurts. But there's actually something that happened this last week that we should actually be almost giddy about. Um, a major, if, if, if it ultimately proves out, a major breakthrough on one of the things that that, that creates misery around the world, let alone our own country, um, but also has real fiscal impacts. So let's actually sort of start with some of the basics. Um, how much do you think we borrowed every single day last year? Um, we were playing with the math a little while ago. We were borrowing about $3.8 billion every single day. Well, break that down, it's a hundred and, let's do that math, 160, bill, or 160 million dollars an hour. And I know every time I get behind these mic and you start talking numbers, people just glaze over. But it's important, because if you're someone that says, I really care about investments in the environment, I really care about investments in healthcare, I really care about investments in education, where do you think the money's going to come from? If we continue policy-wise the avoidance of the drivers of our debt, we continue doing public policy by feelings. One of the things that enrages me around here is we have entire conversations, entire speeches behind these microphones, and then we make public policy by our emotions, by our feelings, but not by a calculator. And I know the calculator sounds cold, and as a Republican, we sound like accountants on steroids. But at some point, the math is important. But also, what happens when I can show you that getting the math right means you don't hurt people? We saw in the Democrats' social spending bill, their Build Back Better, multiple university papers coming out saying, hey, we're looking at this, and we believe the working poor will be poorer at the end of the decade. The disassociation of um, the value of your labors to money coming in, the, the other social policies that were driven in that piece of legislation, they may be great politics, and they're really crappy for the society, and they're really crappy for the very people the left claims they care about. So let's pull it back. And just deal with where we're at right now. Now, this board here is from math from a year ago. And, and once again, we're not going to talk about 1965, but I start with this over and over because I can't tell you how many people will come up to me, you're at Costco, and they walk up and say, David, if you would just cut back on that foreign aid, David, if you would just get rid of waste and fraud, or if the liberals, hey, if you'd cut back on defense spending. Well, we have a reality problem. You see this red area? That's mandatory spending. That's functionally Social Security, Medicare, the primary drivers. The green area over here is what we get to vote on. The little blue area, that's defense. The green is all domestic. It's down to 13% of what we as members of Congress vote on is the non-defense spending around here. And that's today, and this gets dramatically worse. And you know what makes it worse? We're getting old as a society. Demographics. Demographics are actually what primarily drive the US sovereign debt. And yet, how many times, for anyone it's crazy enough to watch C-SPAN, 
our, even our fellow members, our staffs, do we talk about where we're going to be in just a few years? And, and I thought I would also just sort of start with some of the folklore. You'll hear the speeches here of rich people need to pay their fair share. They sure do. A couple months ago, we made a whole presentation here on the floor begging our Democrat colleagues saying, instead of doing policy where you're going to go say, we're going to raise taxes on small businesses, we're going to go raise taxes on individuals, how about just stop subsidizing them? We came in and showed almost $1.4 trillion dollars over 10 years that the policies of this place subsidize the rich. And I'm talking the really rich. And so the Democrats did their Build Back Better social spending bill. And if you look at it, it substantially now subsidizes the really rich even more. The other perversity in that piece of legislation, if you get to the year five, you do realize you've driven almost another $800 billion of borrowing. And then we play this pretend game around here, saying, oh, then we're going to make these programs disappear, and then we're going to keep the taxes going to the rest of the decade. And that's how we only end up with about $400 billion of borrowing. I mean, no wonder those in the public who pay attention to Congress in Washington, D.C., just realize we treat the public like fools. You know, these are people who are just trying to survive. They're trying to take care of their kids. They're trying to get ready for retirement. And this place is basically getting ready to destroy the next couple decades. And the scale of debt is, is off the charts, and it will drive every bit of policy around here. Instead of the fraud that's going on so far this year, where it looks more like trying to buy votes than save the future of this country. And so let's take a quick look. Even a 100% tax rate on small businesses and upper income families, if you took 100% of it, you can't get close to covering where we are spending-wise. It's just math. And I know this is a math-free zone. But at some point, the math will always win. So take a look here. If you took every dime a people that make over $500,000. And with that, every dime of the small business earnings, you get about 5.5% of GDP. You know, that's, that's the most elegant way to do the math. But in 2030, just the borrowing will be 6.3% of GDP. And in 29 years from now, it's 15.1. You don't get close to it. You can take every dime a $500,000 and up in every dime from small business. And where we are 29 years from now, yeah, you, you hit a third of the revenues necessary. We're living in just an absolute economic fraud. The share of federal tax revenue spent on interest, and this is one of those that scares me to death. And let's see if I can try to explain this. What happens to a country when you've borrowed and borrowed and borrowed and borrowed and borrowed and you put yourself right up against the edge? And then you have a new virus. And all of a sudden you need to stabilize the economy. Or, God forbid, there's a military conflict or some other tragedy in your country. You've made yourself very, very fragile as a country. It's the concept of you know, we all have this occasion where we live a little cl too close to the fire, and that one time there's a traffic accident, one time, you know, something happens, and we miss our airplane. We, 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 we understand the consequences of what they call fragility. We're doing that to this country because this board here is really simple. If we had a 2% increase in interest rates, by the time we get to that 29 years from now, 100% of all the tax revenues, 100% of the tax revenues go just to pay the interest payments. I mean, 
you start to think about that, hell, just a 1% rise in interest from the CBO's baseline is 70% of all tax revenues will be consumed just making our interest payments. Is this the future you plan for your children? I mean, is this future this place plans for your own retirement? You think you're going to continue to still get all the benefits you've earned when your government, 100% of its income is going just to cover the borrowing interest? This is where we're at, and this is last year's math. This is before the huge amount of borrowing that's already happened this year. So now the most difficult part of when you get behind this conversation, for those of us that come behind these microphones, this is the part that my brothers and sisters around here on the left, and even a number on the right, don't want to have. What's the primary driver of U.S. sovereign debt? Two things. Remember how I said demographics? It's the fact we're getting older. You got to understand, 29 years from now, and this was actually, this math was done before the massive amount of spending this last year. We will be at $112 trillion of borrowed money in 29 years. And that's inflation adjusted, so today's dollars, $112 trillion of borrowed money, most of it's Medicare. If you're like I am and you believe Medicare is a societal promise we made, how do you plan to keep paying for it? Social Security is the rest of the balance. The rest of the budget's actually in balance. Matter of fact, the latest math actually says the rest of the budget actually has a small positive balance in 29, 30 years. How many times today behind my Democrat microphones, or even the Republican microphones, did we tell the public the truth that if we don't get the, our act together and find a way to disrupt the cost of health care, we've just, and it's a technical economic term um, for the future, we've screwed our kids and our own retirements. And, and I'm sorry to be crass, but I don't know how to get anyone here to listen. It's math. It's demographics. It's not Republican or Democrats. Getting older is not Republican or Democrat. It's not partisan. It's math. And the solution so far this year is, well, let's just spend a hell of a lot more money right now. Let's pay for it with a bunch of fake accounting. And maybe it's enough spending. We can buy enough votes. We'll survive another election. But the country will be... an incredible amount of trouble. So what's the solution? Well, let's first, what's the primary driver? You just saw the slide. The primary driver of US sovereign debt is Medicare. So let's break it down. 5% of our nation's population are brothers and sisters who have really tough lives. They have chronic conditions, they have diabetes, they'll have other comorbidities, as you've heard over and over during the pandemic. Well, they are the majority of our healthcare spending. If you actually love and care for people, why not go and do your very best to help these poor people that are suffering? Oh, by the way, you also get an amazing economic value for it. Go help our brothers and sisters who are sick, who are suffering. But it's not putting up a bunch more clinics. It's investing in the disruptive technologies that are around us right now that are curing people. I, I beg this place to think like disruptors because good politics are, oh, we're going to go spend a bunch of money, we're going to put up a bunch more diabetic, diabetes clinics in my district, and I'll look like a hero. And yeah, maybe that's great politics, but you just functionally patched over the misery, the suffering. Go put the resources in a cure. I did a presentation back in like March or April here talking about a cure for type 1 diabetes and how it also made parts of that will translate to type 2. I saved some of the really nasty emails I got of saying, oh, that isn't true, it can't happen. Wait till the last board here. 
guess what? There are miracles happening around us. Do you remember a couple weeks ago here, I did a little presentation on messenger RNA. We now have a vaccine. Now, it's not 100% effective. It's only mildly effective. It has to be used for malaria. We're, we're about to have, a, looks like, a vaccine for so many other diseases that plague us. Why aren't we putting our resources into something of that nature? Because if it's 5% of our brothers and sisters who are suffering, who are the majority of our healthcare spending, and healthcare spending is what's bankrupting the country, putting up a bunch more clinics doesn't solve the problem, but also the other absurdity. You'll have, I, I will have liberal friends who will say, well, we did the ACA, the Obama, known as Obamacare. That was a financing bill. It basically just moved around who got subsidized and who had to pay. It didn't change the price of health care. And I hate to say the Republican alternative did the same thing. We just moved around who got subsidized, who had to pay. I think we did some more things to create some creativity and competitiveness, but that bill died in the Senate. We did pass it out of the House. But then you'll get some that say, well, how about Medicare for all? Medicare for all doesn't save a dime. Model after model after model says it doesn't save a dime unless you begin rationing. And even then, it really doesn't save much. So what do you do? What are the actual drivers? You remember that Medicare number? That is the primary driver of our debt? Remember, it was what on that chart, it was $77 trillion over the next 29 years. And after this year's of binge spending, God knows what the new numbers are. 31% of Medicare spending is just diabetes. So almost a third of overall healthcare spending is just diabetic, diabetes. Take a step and think about, for someone like myself who's terrified of that failed bond auction because we've built up so much more debt, and the public and internationally, they just don't have an appetite for our debt anymore. <coughs> that becomes the cascade of hell. But if I came to you and said, why don't we focus on how to help people not have such misery, but also it would have incredible effects on our fiscal situation, 31% of just Medicare is diabetes. So, why aren't we doing something like an Operation Warp Speed on diabetes? Instead of social spending bills where maybe we can buy another election with taxpayers' money and then borrow and borrow and borrow and then use absolute fraud as the pretend of how it's going to be paid for. Or we could do something where we end people's misery and the future looks brighter and optimistic. So this slide here, I think I brought to the floor in April. And we actually had a whole, I did a whole little thing about the concept of the technology was being developed. Um, and it's really impressive. And they've worked on it for years of taking stem cells and adjusting the DNA there to make it, and forgive me if I mispronounce these things, an islet cell, and islet cells, their ability to produce insulin. And I showed this slide, and I still have a few of those emails of folks saying, oh, stop making things up. This technology can't work. You can't cure diabetes. Well, a couple great articles this weekend. And this is where the optimism is. This should be a place of optimism. We live in an amazing country. We have suffered and done great things. And yet, we seem to roll in misery these days instead of the fact that we're on the cusp of ending so many individuals' misery, sickness, and maybe even changing the world. So I, I only did this just that just so people could visualize. Imagine the concept of grabbing some stem cells. You know, you can grab them now from skin. We've learned all sorts of things. The ability to program them, and then functionally, you can teach them to grow into what you need.
Well, if we have that technology, just imagine the diseases, the illnesses, the misery. So you have messenger RNA that now we're about to know how to take on so many viruses, so many other types of diseases. We now are about to have the technology, actually we actually do now have the technology, to actually take on other types of diseases where it's failures of certain organs. And now I'm going to give you one other one just as part of the thought experiment before we do the closing board that I'm most excited about. If Congress wanted to have an impact on health care costs, what is something we could do in one year? What's something we could do, Republicans and Democrats, could do in one year? If I came to you right now and said, in one year, yeah, you're not going to get all of it, but 16% of health care spending turns out to be people not taking their pharmaceuticals as they should. You realize that's well over a half a trillion dollars a year. A half a trillion dollars a year is spending because someone didn't take their high blood pressure pill and they have their stroke. They had trouble, they didn't take their insulin, they didn't do this and that. What if I came to you right now and said, instead of nationalizing healthcare, instead of doing this, doing that, why don't we promote, subsidize, make it part of CMS's, the technology where the pill bottle cap beeps at grandma when she didn't take her meds. For someone like myself with high blood pressure, you know, I take my pill religiously, but if I didn't, my phone would beep at me and say, David, we don't want you to have a stroke. Please take your medicine because we know it works. We know the same thing. How many people do we know who've had clogged arteries that if they had just taken their statins? 16% of all healthcare spending relates back to people not taking their meds. That's $528 billion a year. There are disruptions, and if you took, take that and then put it into what we already know about the messenger RNA and the fact that there's so many illnesses and diseases, you've seen the art, if, if you read anything, you have to have seen the articles that the belief that we're close to a vaccine for HIV, close to a vaccine for herpes, close to, um, now you see the vaccine out there going out for malaria. Um, there's so many amazing things happening. The opportunity, and you saw it in that very first, uh, that two boards back, When I came to this mic back last March, and we talked about, hey, there's maybe this stem cell therapy that's going to turn how to make islet cells that actually could be injected back into someone, and it could be at least the cure for type 1. How many of you saw the articles this weekend? Now, it's only one person. It was the first person they tried it on. And guess what? It works. they have successfully cured someone with type 1 diabetes. That's a million and a half of our brothers and sisters in this nation. Now, what are we willing to do to find a way to almost put that type of technology, let's, let's have it be proofed, are we willing to put it on a production line, just like we've done messenger RNA on a production line, and now can we also make the really tough policy decisions? Are we willing to change Farm bill, nutrition, some of the inputs into type 2 diabetes, and if we can fix those, the articles are saying, the papers are saying, the same ability to fix the body's ability to make insulin again may be a path to cure type 2 diabetes. And if that's true, think about it. You just saw primary driver of U.S. sovereign debt is Healthcare costs, Medicare. 31% of just Medicare spending is just diabetes. Why wouldn't this place take on something that's that obvious, that's that loving and compassionate, and also really, really makes a big difference to our future, both economically and just from a 
moral health standpoint of loving and caring for our brothers and sisters. And the last thing I'll throw out, we're working on a little project in my office and the math is really hard. If you care about things like income inequality and you look at the differentials of our brothers and sisters, my tribal communities out west, other people that may have urban minority communities that are suffering from things like type 2 diabetes, we're trying to figure out what would the math look like if those populations had this disease cured? What would their economics? Would we actually see so many others able to come back into society, back into the economy, back into trying to develop a life in the middle class? The crazy thing is our preliminary math, it may turn out that curing a big portion of our population that we see the huge income inequality and helping them get back into society and the economy may be one of the most powerful things, if not one of the large, maybe the single largest thing we could do to actually take on income inequality in this country. Who would have ever thought? But it's math. I want to make the argument that people who here who want to make policy by their feelings are crushing individuals, crushing families, crushing the country. People who are willing to see love and compassion through actual facts are how we do what's moral, do what's right, and also do what makes this country just great as can be. And with that, Madam Speaker, I yield back. is the hazard of when you use far too many boards. Um, I, I want to do a couple of things this evening. First, I'm going to offer a solution because I believe, particularly my brothers and sisters on the left, um, the administration are in a very bad place on one issue, and I, I think there's a genuine solution coming um, maybe within the next couple of weeks. And then we're going to spend some time talking about something that's often uncomfortable around here, and that's the debt ceiling. And the reality of the math and why it is a sin that we're not going to actually engage in the stressor and use that stressor, which is the debt ceiling, to make a couple steps towards reality on what the math looks like. So first off, um, and a little of this is going to come across a bit sarcastic because I mean it too. But what happened a year and a half ago, two years ago, when COVID came to our shores, came to the world, we had discussions here, often on Zoom. We were going to do the science. We were going to follow the facts and also accept that what we know today will be different tomorrow. We were going to slow down the spread. Not because we thought we could avoid the virus, but because we were worried about emergency rooms and ORs being, or excuse me, um, emergency rooms and others being overflow with our brothers and sisters who were sick. Here we are approaching almost two years later. We have multiple vaccines. We have antibodies and 
you saw the data, particularly on the Pfizer antiviral therapeutic pill. There is a pill coming, if the data is real, what we read is real, is about 89% effective. Now, it's a lot of pills. You've got to take over five days. But there's a therapeutic coming that you can take at home. So we have home test kits. And if you will go back to our own rhetoric and the conversations with the scientists and the experts, it was always, we don't have a therapeutic. If it's true in about three weeks, we're going to have a protease inhibitor. That's, that's just, if you read the science on it, it's really neat how it snips the protein, keeps it from attaching into the cell. It's remarkable science. It's also going to help us on all sorts of other future viruses. But the ultimate antiviral is almost here. So if this is almost here, why isn't it time to have a simple policy discussion saying, wasn't this the standard that we were all hoping and waiting for, the technology, the belief in science, that would allow us to declare the pandemic over. And by doing that, the dystopian sort of fight that's going on in our society where the Senate yesterday said, no vaccine mandates, where, what is it now, five different federal courts have said it's unconstitutional. Brother after brother, sister after sister, neighborhood after neighbor, Republican versus Democrat, where now we've turned it into an article of faith. The left lives, lives in a ball of fear over the disease, and the right lives in a frustration and anger that they believe the freedoms are being stripped away in the country. How about we embrace science? The fact of the matter is, go back a year and a half ago, this was the miracle we were waiting for. It's almost here. Why wouldn't we pass a simple piece of legislation that functionally says, hey, when the FDA says that we have successful therapeutic, an antiviral, that's really effective, let's declare the pandemic over. Let's get ourselves away from this dystopian polarization that's not based in science anymore. We've turned it into a religion. I think we're better than this. And the fact matters, we've dropped a piece of legislation weeks ago that basically said that. It basically said, when science is victorious, we will embrace the science, declare the pandemic over. Now, it doesn't mean the virus goes away. It doesn't mean some of our brothers and sisters aren't going to get sick. But the fact of the matter is the math is the math. We've had more of our brothers and sisters die this year than we did last year. And do you remember the political rhetoric? Maybe I shouldn't go there. But maybe it really is the moment to consider this to my brothers and sisters on the left. I'm extending you a lifeline. I'm giving you a chance to back away from a society of fear and hate to a society that says, we conquered. So please, um, for anyone that's listening, for my brothers and sisters here in Congress, Mr. Speaker, yourself, give it a consideration. Has science won? And if it is, let's embrace it. Let's declare this pandemic over because it stops the cascade effect of removing troops that want to serve to the, the chaos around here of, you know, we play this fake virtue signaling game where there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of us sitting here for hours we're wearing our little masks, but we're all sitting right next to each other talking, then pulling our masks down to have a drink of water. And then, you know, come on, it's theater. Let's get back to science. All right. A few years ago, I remember being here on the floor, and the then Democrat leader got behind the microphone and basically called those of us who made it very clear we would not vote for a clean debt ceiling, arsonists. And that has bothered me ever since because I think actually in many ways those of us who did not believe in a clean debt ceiling, raising the debt ceiling once again without some attempt to slow the chaos, slow the spending down, I actually think those of us who wanted to bend the debt curve, we weren't the arsonists. 
we were actually in some ways the fire prevention crew. We were trying to save the country, save the society. So first off, does everyone understand how bad the math is? We're functionally borrowing $47,000 every second. We borrow $2,841,000 a minute. Okay, so I'm going to speak for what, a half an hour? $2,800,000 is $84,000, $84 million in the half an hour I'm going to speak is going to be borrowed. $84 million will be borrowed during the half an hour I speak. But we're functionally borrowing over $4 billion every single day. And we're not heading towards ever paying this off. And the perverse thing, do you understand, in a decade, that number almost doubles. It almost doubles. And for, back to the rhetoric of arson, go back over our history over the last 50 years. The only times, well, except for one where, God bless them, in the 80s, they actually took on the shortfalls in Social Security. But you look at the different deals that have been made to bend the debt curve, almost every single one was associated with a debt ceiling. It was that one stressor. We've all heard over and over and over, Congress will not do something unless they feel the pressure, unless they feel there's a crisis, unless they're up against the wall. And the game that was played here is saying, oh, let's change the rules for the Senate. Let's make it so they can do it 50 votes, and that way we can just pass this. We don't have to deal with the reality of the burying of people's future retirements and destroying my little girl's future in debt. We can just avoid it and go home and have a nice Christmas. But the fact of the matter is almost every agreement we've had has been associated with the stressor that was brought on by a debt ceiling. Graham Rudman. 1985, and functionally again in 87. Debt limit increase associated with it. Deficit reduction and automatic spending and budget triggers. Pago. I can't tell you how many times I've had Democrats here preach Pago to me, except for the fraud that Pago really is, where, hey, on the fifth year, we'll just pretend it no longer costs anything, therefore it doesn't fall under the Pago rules. But the Pago rules functionally every time, four times, was associated with changing the borrowing limits of the country, the debt ceiling. It was supposed to create deficit reduction, and it did create some. Spending increases must be offset, and that is the ultimate cultural change that PAYGO produced. But remember, it came about because of a debt ceiling fight, multiple debt ceiling fights. Budget Control Act, you remember how controversial this one was. We had actually a government shutdown and other things associated with this. But the Budget Control Act, sequestration that came with that, if you look at it, was the most successful in modern times of bending the spending curve. The problem is it's all in discretionary, and we all know the fraud around here is discretionary is now down to what, 10% or so, well, actually no, 15% of what we actually spend if you strip military out. Military is now 10%, rest of discretionary 15%, the other 70 plus percent is functionally on autopilot. But this is the truth. And once again, the, the left, look, Democrats have control of this place. They control the White House, they control the Senate, they control the House. Okay, bless their precious hearts. But we could have used this as a stressor and there would have been lots of, oh, my hair is on fire, the world's coming to the end, I'm worried about the stock market, oh, wink, wink, nod, nod, and the stock market just goes on because they know we'll fix something. But used it as an excuse, even if we have to tell our constituents why we're trying to do something tough. Because remember, the lobbyists here in this town aren't here to help us reduce spending, they're here with their hands out wanting more spending. This place is functionally, structurally designed to get everything you can 
and hell be damned one day when we hit that failed bond auction. And you all saw it today, it wasn't a big deal, but today's bond auction was slightly un undersubscribed when U.S. sovereign debt was being sold. I'm not saying it's a canary in a mine, but the canary did have a little cough. And so here's what we're going to do today. I think the Senate may be voting at this moment. We're just functionally going to do a debt increase, probably what, we come back, what, on Tuesday? We still don't know what the number is going to be. Or maybe we do the fraud of just do it to a date. Will there be any deficit reduction, any attempt, any, any dis, any, anything to force some rational math of what's going on? No, because it's uncomfortable. Because we have to tell the truth about the drivers of our debt. And what is the drivers of our debt? Okay, I have said this over and over and over, but we need to be honest. The left will say, oh, it's military. It's, it's rich people not paying enough taxes. The right, we have our sins too. We'll say, oh, it's foreign aid. It's, um, oh, 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 it's, it's, foreign, it's waste and fraud. No, it's not. The primary driver of U.S. sovereign debt is we are getting old. It's demographics, and demographics isn't Republican or Democrat, it's math. And, and you've got to understand how sharp this curve is. We are functionally right here. So here's 2022. We're functionally, let's say, 17% of our population is over 65 today. You do see how fast we start getting up to close to 22% of our population being over 65. This is the driver of our debt. Remember the math, and I'm going to do it a couple times here, and I'm sorry this upsets people because they don't want us to tell the truth. Primary driver of U.S. sovereign debt is Medicare. Simply Medicare, and then Social Security, and the rest of the budget actually is in balance. Through the next 30 years, the rest of the budget is actually in balance. It's demographics. If you made a pledge when you ran for office around here that you were going to protect people's retirement, you were going to protect Social Security, you were going to protect Medicare, Letting it be buried in debt. How's that protecting it? Tell the truth. And there are solutions. I've come behind this mic so many times and said, there's technology out there. There's things we can do to crash the price of health care. There's policies we can do to grow the economy. Everything should be fixated on what maximizes economic growth. And then the left moves something there, build back better, their social entitlement spending, that the data says it slows down the economy. We will be poorer and smaller, and the working poor will be poor at the end of the decade because the way they design their social entitlement spending legislation, we're doing everything half-assed backwards. If you lay out sort of the holistic theory, you know, sort of the integrated model, yeah, you've got to fix immigration, but you, got to, you focus on immigration being about maximizing economic expansion, not importing poverty. Adoption of technology that maximizes people being healthy and cures, cures, cures. Remember last week we came here and talked about the miracle from last week that we've cured someone of type 1 diabetes. Because remember, 31% of all of our spending in Medicare is just type 2 diabetes. What happens if you do cures and in people's misery, oh, by the way, you get amazing benefits on our debt. The immediate reaction you'll get from people on the left is, well, Schweiker got behind the mic and wanted to cut entitlements. No, I'm trying to find a way to save them. But you save them by changing the cost curve. You save them by having a moment. Pretend you're at a 12-step group. Isn't the first step to admit you have a problem? This place can't make it to step one. So let's do a little math. And I'm sorry, I do this over and over, but I, I continue to be just shocked the number of staff around here will grab me in the elevator and say, is that number real? Is this real? And you say, this is the single biggest issue policy-wise facing Washington, facing this country, and we will chase shiny objects because shiny objects don't make your brain hurt. We will have asinine discussions about, oh, there's a vaccine database, there's this, there's that. And you realize it's a con. That is part of the scam this place does is look at the shiny object. We can chase that because this hurts. 
reality. And this number is worse today. This is based on last year's math. $112 trillion inflation-adjusted public borrowing in 29 years. $112 trillion of borrowing will be our publicly held debt in 29 years. 77.7 of that is just Medicare. 34.8 is Social Security. The rest of the federal budget is in balance. This is just demographics. The cure is economic growth and crashing the price of health care. This will drive every bit of public policy, and it's coming very fast. If you look at our borrowing curve, in a decade, we go from what's projected sort of these days where we're going to be borrowing a trillion dollars a year to a couple trillion dollars a year. The debt will, and the borrowing will, and the interest will drive all policy. And this place right now, there's more policy worried about how to get reelected than saving the country in the future. Do you understand? Do you understand? A two-point increase in interest rates from nominal interest rates that have been projected. If we go up just 2%, and that's getting us actually closer to what the historic mean is. In 2051, 100% of revenues, 100% of revenues, 100% of revenues go just to pay interest. How come this isn't the number one discussion here? Now, the left may have different ways to approach it than those on the right, but you would think it, this would be all we could talk about. And it's avoided around here like the virus. Except we haven't figured out how to put a mask on it and give it social distancing, have we? And for my brothers and sisters on the left, the number of times I will try to sit down in working groups with my Democrat colleagues, and I believe their heart may be in the right place. They don't own a calculator, their math isn't there, but, but you know, we make public policy by our feelings in this place. We make public policy because it feels good, it has a great title, we get judged by our intentions, not by our outcomes. And that's incredibly dangerous. So think about some of the, the rhetoric. This board, and, and I've done presentations here where I walk through every single revenue, what the proper term is receipts, generating proposal from the left. And if you did all of them and pretended they had no economic effects, no secondary effects, all of them, you can't still raise, come close to raise enough revenues. Even a 100% tax rate on small businesses and upper income families could not come close to balancing the long-term budget. You can take all the rich people's money and all the revenues from those small businesses that they own. You can take every dime. This is a percentage of GDP number. When you get into these sorts of numbers, you start doing the percentage of GDP. We are heading towards 15% of GDP functionally being borrowing. And if you take every dime, you only get about 5% of GDP. We're screwed. If, and I'm sorry, I know that's crass, but I, I just don't know how to get folks to want to pay attention to it. This is the single most important thing going on here is if you care about education, if you care about health, if you care about science, if you care about space, if you care about you know, equality, if you care about these things, when there's no more money, when every dime of resources goes so we survive, and do our best to avoid that failed bond auction, which God forbid if it does, an interest rate spike. Do you have any idea how fragile we've made our society? And this isn't off in the future, this is today. We will kiss up close to, what is it, 30 trillion in borrowing, probably in the next few months. 
These are unthinkable numbers. And it's here. And this, and got to understand, these projections are based on this concept, a really simple one. There's going to be no more wars. There's not going to be another pandemic. There's not going to be an economic collapse. There's not going to be a mortgage collapse. We've done this to ourselves. And then the left comes here and we do things like the Build Back Better, the social spending bill, which ultimately, and, and we have different number because God knows what the Senate's going to do, but the simple scoring from CBO basically said at year five, it's borrowed another $800 billion. Oh, by the way, wink, wink, nod, nod, after year five, we'll actually stop all these programs and we'll start to raise revenues to pay it off. We're functionally going to add another four trillion plus in borrowing. Mr. Speaker, may I ask for the time? <clears throat> the gentleman has six minutes remaining. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The social spending bill. At the end of the decade, you realize the economy will have missed Tremendous amounts of economic growth. Some of the best models coming from the Tax Foundation, we're actually making ourselves poor because of the design of the spending. When you tell people I'm going to send you a check but you don't have to work. When I'm putting money into things that don't actually create productivity. Remember, what are the two ways you pay people more money? Inflation, well that doesn't get you anywhere. Or productivity. That was one of the miracles of the end of the 2017 tax reform is the resources that went for companies to buy equipment to be more productive so they could pay their workers more, and you saw it, you saw a miracle of employment and wage growth. And then the cynicism that when two-thirds of millionaires get tax cuts under the Democrats' Build Back Better plan. So you tell us the rich need to pay their fair share, and then you design pieces of legislation that give hundreds of billions of dollars to rich people. And then you tell us, oh, by the way, we should put state and local back into it, but the most of it goes to really rich people. I mean, come on. If you want to do something, okay, you want revenues. We did a whole presentation here a few months ago that said we can show you over 10 years $1.4 trillion you can get. Stop subsidizing really, really rich people. Instead, the left does a piece of legislation to subsidize them more. I mean, I guess my intense frustration is we are heading, it may not be the bubble where the economy blows up, but we are heading to a type of rot because so much of this nation's resources will be used to survive the amount of debt we've piled up. And then we're adopting policies that don't create any type of escape philosophy of we're curing diseases that drive the debt because most of the debt is driven by health care. We're doing investments in things that grow the economy. We're getting immigration codes and regulatory codes and other things. We're modernizing them so they maximize economic opportunity because we actually give a darn about poor people. We give a darn about the working poor. We give a darn about people who are heading towards retirement. We give a darn about young people having a future. And not one of those things is actually in the math. It's in the rhetoric. People spin some great stories here, but it's not in the math, Mr. Speaker. It's just not in the math. It's not in the economic analysis. The universities that have looked at what's going on right now tell us at the end of the decade, the poor are going to be poorer. Come on, what type of economic violence is this will place willing to subject the working poor, the middle class to? We're better than this. And there is a path. You're not going to pay off the debt, Mr. Speaker, but we could adopt enough policies to flatten the curve that my six-year-old daughter actually has a future. And doesn't she deserve one? And with that, I yield back, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman yields back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 4th, 2021, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Roy, for 30 minutes. 
I thank the speaker. I want to thank my friend from Arizona for being willing to stand on the floor of the United States House of Representatives when unfortunately so many of my colleagues are not this evening to talk about the danger of facing our country. And the gentleman outlines, if I believe I'm correct, that we'll be facing $112 trillion of debt come 2050 if we do not change course, if we do not take the steps necessary to make changes with respect to our health care spending and make wise policy choices. Like any family, any budget that, uh, that you have to maintain if you're running a business, a nonprofit, a university, virtually everybody in the world, or at least everybody in this country, except for this body right here, that has to maintain and balance a budget and make determinations and make tough choices. If the gentleman would indulge me for a minute or two, for a couple more minutes on the floor, when was the last time, if the gentleman recalls, we've had the ability to amend a piece of legislation on the floor of this body? <laughs> Truly amend it. Does the gentleman remember? Will, will the gentleman yield? I will. You know, brilliant question. And, and for, I cannot actually think of something that was substantive, where there was a collective idea from, from my brothers and sisters on the left to the right, that there was actual intellectual battle here where we made something better. This place is functionally a intellectual dictatorship. Would it surprise the gentleman that it was May of 2016, the no. last time that an amendment was offered on the floor of this body in open debate? Now, to be clear, that is an assessment of leadership in both parties. But how on earth can we actually solve the problems, I would ask the speaker, if we don't come down and sit at this table and stop looking up at the C-SPAN cameras and just sit around this table and start with a budget, like any family or any business, and say, here's how much money we have, here's how we can responsibly spend for the betterment of the people, have disagreements about what those priorities are, and make choices. When was the last time that we've done that? It's a rhetorical question, but I know one data point is that May of 2016 was the last time that any member of this body was able to walk onto this floor and offer an amendment that wasn't pre-cooked up in rules previously and already set up by the leadership structure of either party. Would the gentleman agree that that is no way for the People's House to operate? Will the gentleman allow me just a quick colloquy with him? Yes, sir. The process is broken. It's why I come here almost every week, and you do too, and we try to just focus on what's ahead of us. And, and look, you know, I just spent a half an hour sort of focusing on debt and deficit. That's not Republican or Democrat. It's what's ahead of us. You've been here a few years. years. How many actual real discussions, other than theater of, we should do a study commission, we should write a strongly worded memo. The theater of this place, instead of doing what's really hard, and understand, you can't just do one thing. That's the great fraud now. We've gotten ourselves in such a difficult position. It's got to be everything. You know, um, a couple years ago I came here and we brought in 19 attributes that you had to do almost at the exact same time to maximize enough economic growth, enough technology disruption, all the things to make it work. You actually helped me on some of that. But my fear, those are really uncomfortable, and you'll have an army of lobbyists really unhappy with you when you tell the truth about the math. Well, the, the gentleman's completely correct, and there's no debate about that. You want to have a conversation about solving the Medicare crisis driving $112 trillion, then you have to have a conversation about solving the health care crisis. And to solve the health care crisis, you need to actually be willing, both sides of the aisle, to take on the army of lobbyists representing the insurance companies, the hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, all minting money right now, by the way, literally minting money. And you got to be willing to have a conversation about that to actually figure out how we can transform our health care system to be patient-centered, doctor-centered, and not have to go to an insurance bureaucrat or a government bureaucrat to figure out what your health care looks like and then get competition, transparency, and drive down prices. 
because if you drive down prices, we can actually solve the Medicare crisis. Look, the gentleman knows in, in many quarters I'm a bit of a heretic on this. Mm. I actually believe we're on the cusp of miracles. If it's true that we just found a cure for type 1 diabetes, mm -hmm. if it's the math is true, about one third of all U.S. healthcare spending is just type 2 diabetes. For my Native American populations, for my urban poor, for my rural Anglo poor, the amount of diabetes, the misery, the suffering, wouldn't it be one of the most elegant, noble things we could do is say, screw this noise we're doing. We're going to do our Operation Warp Speed. We now th we see there's a stem cell to an islet, to the islet producing insulin. There is a path, but it requires intellectual discipline, telling the truth, and saying no to a lot of people who are going to be upset because a cure ends the misery. It also mends the manipulation. Well, I would agree with the gentleman, and, and I hope that we can reach a point where, to your point, you asked me a question about how many times we had a real substantive debate. The closest I can remember was I made this point about amendments on the floor of the House, and Stenny, or the gentleman from Maryland, the leader, said uh, in an agreement, yeah, I, I wish we had more debate on the floor, and I wish we, we didn't have to well, I'd say to the leader, well, let's do it, right? Let's, let's, let's start. Let's drop a bill on the floor instead of a 2,000-page monstrosity that costs X trillions of dollars, that was passed on rules, that's brought to the floor, that we then offer an MTR, and then we go give press conferences about why we can't support it. That, that's just no way to actually do the work of the people. Let's drop a bill here on the floor that starts with the shelf, like the NDAA last week. Let's just put a bill here on the table, and then let's offer amendments. Right? We had a whole fight about draft our daughters, about vaccine mandates, all these things. Well, just start with the NDAA and then offer some amendments. Let the votes work. Let the people speak. Chip, you're a heretic. I am. <laughs> I am. Look, um, before I leave you, I'm still hopeful. I think there's a path that saves us. But the window for that escape is getting very narrow. It's shrinking. The speed of debt accumulation, the unwillingness to deal with complex problems, with complex solutions, because that's reality, is closing fast on us. And the number of members who are like you, who are willing to come to the floor and say very difficult things that are truthful, they're becoming rarer. So, well, thank I you. appreciate the gentleman. Thank you for the colloquy trip. Yes, sir. God bless you. I'll see you next week.